This is Join Us in France, episode 28. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a wonderful storyteller. A yacker. <laughs> On today's show, we talk about the main wine regions in France, and we go into more details about the wines of the Loire Valley. A yes. wonderful place. Wine is in France's DNA. I'm sure she will tell us that there was, there was wine here for a long, long oh, time. Oh, yes, a long, long time. And yes. it's one of the pleasures in life. And we're not wine experts, but we try to become wine experts. <laughs> <coughs> she pushes me to being a wine expert, actually. <laughs> it's all your fault, Annie. <laughs> well, you should see the selection we get just at a regular French s supermarket. I'm going to have to take my camera into a supermarket and see if I can take some oh, pictures. Oh, do camera cache, yes. Yeah, yeah. I have to hide my camera because hmm. they don't like it when... But anyway, well, maybe I'll go at 8 a.m. or something <laughs> <laughs> when there's nobody around. Um, but it's, it's just crazy. We have so much choice. And, of course, every time I go on vacation anywhere in France, I make it a point to try some of the local wines. I'm sure you do the same. I try to. So, so we've tried over the years many many different wines and that certainly does not make us experts but maybe you know interested uh, participants that's right <laughs> we're, we're talking from the point of view of uh, people who enjoy having nice wine but we're not experts and we're not on the locks that's right but before we get too drunk just talking about wine hmm. <laughs> let me share something that's really important to me uh, we have a Facebook group, as you know, and we have, uh, right now, we have 149 followers on that group, and that's wonderful. We would love more. But I've noticed that many of the posts I put on that Facebook page are not shown to all the people who've liked us. Now, this is something that Facebook does. They, it's kind of a newish thing on Facebook. They don't show everything. They want to kind of manipulate us by showing us what suits them. Um, so what can you do about that? If you want to see our updates in your news feed, the only thing you can do is you have to like, every time you see a post from us, like it. And I even if you, you also have to comment on things, even if it's just to say, Oh, I agree, or oh, that, isn't that strange, or whatever, you know. If you write something and if you like it, they will show you more of that content. Because today, this morning when I logged on to Facebook, at least half of the things I could see there were advertising. And I think it must mean that I'm not liking enough things from other people, because... What do they have left to show me is ads. I don't want to see their ads. I don't want to see their ads. No. Right. I'd much rather see, you know, other things. So, so if you'd like to see more of our stuff, please like everything you see from us and also talk back. That's the secret. If you interact with us, they'll show it to you. If you don't, they won't. There you go. Now, a little music to get us in the mood. But how about a little glass of wine, Elise? Can I... Oh, what I love <laughs> one. Well, but I better go. wait until I'm done speaking because <laughs> no. otherwise I don't think I'm going to you, be very coherent. When <laughs> you I can speak. do both, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> could I Just guess? Just a little bit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So here we go, Elise. How about wine? Here, let's drink to that. <laughs> How about that? So actually, I thought we would start uh, maybe what we could consider to be a series of uh, podcasts about different wine regions, but that we would begin by just talking about the production of wine in France in general, because uh, besides the pleasure aspect of it, it is actually a major, major industry in France. Indeed. And a very, very important source of revenue mm -hmm. uh, for the country. And um, it is true that like with cheese, France is the largest wine producing country in the world, not only in quantity, but in the number of different kinds of wines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are certain parts of the world that are starting to, to develop a lot of wines. 
um, we know that uh, the California West Coast of the United States, Australia is coming up in the world. Uh, there's parts of South America, there's South Africa. But uh, aside from even uh, Italian and Spanish uh, wines too, but, but nobody has come close to the variety and the changes in taste of the different wines that you have in a country that is really relatively small. True. Uh, so just a little bit, uh, some statistics before I talk about the different names of the different regions and mention a couple of the areas of France where, in fact, there are not. In fact, I was thinking it's easier to talk about where there isn't wine in France <laughs> than where there is. True. Um, but uh, now these are statistics that are sometimes hard to verify or argue about. But just like with the cheeses, uh, the last statistics I looked at said that of the 99 departments, which are now administrative districts in France, 80 produce wine. That's a lot. That's a lot. 90, so 80 out of, out of 99. Out of 99, right. <clears throat> there That's are lot. listed. Now, obviously, uh, some of these are include wines that are very local wines that do not get exported even out of the region. 3,240 different wines. Wow. That is a lot of different kinds of wine. So if you wanted to try a different wine every day in France... You would need <laughs> almost 10 years. <laughs> Just to try one bottle. Just to try one bottle. You'd have to find them all, too, which yeah, is probably going to be a little bit it's hard. Because really some of yeah. them, I'm sure, are really very, very local. The, the distribution channels are kind of complicated in France, actually. Well, I'm not sure how that works. But, of course, you have uh, wines that are largely local wines, which you and I know about. And, mm -hmm. and then there are wines that are obviously the ones that mostly get exported mm -hmm. and that have the bigger names, if you want to call it that. But uh, what's interesting is that in terms of uh, wine making itself, you know, there's a huge agency, not only is there an agency that does quality control that is run by the government, but you have uh, the wine makers themselves who belong to what would almost be like a, a union. It's not quite a union, but they have a huge, very important lobbying organization mm -hmm. for making of wines. And they do their own uh, controlling of quality because they don't want uh, French wines to be slurred and they don't want to have scandals like have happened in Spanish wines and Italian wines mm. in, in the past. And nobody so far has, has had to deal with that in, in France. There are, uh, 16 or 17, according to which, which article or which, uh, <laughs> book you read 16 or 17 of what are called, uh, the great, uh, vineyard areas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, if, if people, have a vague idea of the shape of France, which, uh, you know, we have mentioned is called the hexagon because it has this vague shape of being like a six-sided um, form. Uh, largely, it is the northern and northwestern parts of France that do not produce wine. Mm, okay. And obviously, uh, one of the things about wine in France, and this is very important for people to know, because when they come to France to buy wine, it's going to be very different than looking even for French wine in a store in their hometown, whether you're in the States or in Australia or, or Canada, mm -hmm. because wines in France are never, at least most of the time, because I have to say that now, unfortunately, and I really mean unfortunately, wines here are starting to cater to uh, outside of French tastes in the way they label their wines but theoretically a wine in France is labeled according to where the wine comes from and not the variety of grape right so uh, we know about this and we'll talk about this some more but for instance in the states where you may go to a store and look for a Merlot or a Cabernet Sauvignon here you will not most of the time you will look for a wine that comes from a specific region. Right. And uh, most wines, most, and again I say most because unfortunately, really, it is changing to suit the taste of tourists who come. Most wines are a blend of two or three varieties of grapes. That's right. And a good wine, which is the kind we're talking about, and that doesn't mean an expensive wine, but a wine that is not just basic table wine, not very good quality, but a wine that is what you want to buy or look for is a wine that will have the letters A-O-C 
on the bottle. Right. Which means the term in French is appellation d'origine, contrôlée. And what that means is there is a control done that guarantees that the wine is from where it says it is from. Right, the pr producer, the producer gets checked. The producers get checked. And there are three things. The wine must say where it is from. They do not have to say what kinds of grapes they do now on the back. If you have a back label, sometimes they do. They will m show you the mix on the great bottles of wine. You will not see that no. because the wine is known by literally the village it comes from, the uh, side of a hill it comes from, and the winemaker, and, and the winemaker, which means the chateau. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this is very, very important to know. Now I'm going to go through the list of the areas. Many of these names are familiar to people because they know them either from wines or from knowing them as famous areas of France. And there are a few that you probably don't know. And there's one that I never heard of before. Oh. And I actually had to uh, do some research to find out about it. Um, it's certainly not a wine I've ever tasted or don't know if I have, if I have. Mm. Uh, and it's very, very strange. It's a challenge. I'm it's a challenge. find it All right. now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. So let's begin because this is actually in alphabetical order. Mm. Uh, an area we have talked about in a podcast, Alsace. Right. And uh, Alsatian wines are very, very famous and uh, very distinctive. And um, one of the reasons they are very distinctive is because... They use varieties of grapes that do not exist or do not grow anywhere else in France. And that is very interesting. And I'm not quite sure the reason, but they were obviously varieties of grapes that were introduced uh, from Germany. And mm. even one, the Toke, was introduced uh, originally is from Hungary. And so, and that's when, a red. The Toke is a uh, red. It's a red. The Riesling is white. A Gewürztraminer is a white. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's uh, one more that off the top of my head I can't think of. But basically, when you drink a, a wine from Alsace, it's very, very distinctive in terms of its taste. And so you know that it is. And they're considered to be very, very good wines. I it's, sure like them. You like them a lot. Yeah, yeah. I like them. I, I, I think as an aperitif, so meaning a pre-dinner drink kind of thing, um, it a, a white Alsatian wine is it's very nice. really nice. Yeah, it's very. It really has very distinctive taste to yeah. it. Yeah. Otherwise, also with Turkey, I Turkey. I really like yeah. um, Alsatian wines with Turkey. Mm. So for Thanksgiving, probably that's what you're gonna drink at my house. Mm. <laughs> is that what I've been drinking at your house? I didn't probably. even realize it. Yeah. Oh well. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the next in line, of course, is probably the one that is the most famous, and that is, of course, Bordeaux. And the, now yeah. remember, I'm. We're not going to talk about details, and we're not talking about different chateaus. No, we're I'm going just mentioning overall. regions, and yeah. this is geographic regions of France. Yeah. So uh, these are specific. The, they're governmentally decided upon in the sense that they, you can see a map that shows the limits of each of these regions. Mm -hmm. And then to understand the classification, you have within those regions, you have wines that have different categories in terms of how good they are considered uh, but they are still wines that means that the grapes have been grown and the wine has been created within a certain geographical area right especially with Bordeaux because Bordeaux puts out so much wine and you have the whole gamut you have some Bordeaux wines that are truly uh, to me not something I want to drink uh, and you have others that are f divine. Well, they're some of the most expensive wines in the world yeah, are yes. in Bordeaux. So there's the whole gamut because the, because of the sheer number of the right. production of wine in Bordeaux. It's right. huge. And I mean, when we do Bordeaux, we will do, of course, yeah. wines from Bordeaux. Uh, Beaujolais, which uh, oh. is something that's starting to be very popular outside of France. And yeah. is considered to be a new wine. That is, it's not a wine that is kept and is not aged. It's a wine that is drunk the year it is produced. And it is a well, light wine. There are several kinds, right? There's Beaujolais Village. That's uh... Right, but the, none of them are aged at okay, all. Okay. And that is a region, uh, if you look on a map of France, uh, it's lower down on the Rhone Valley. It's actually below the next region, which is a very important region and is, to me, the region that has really, for me, the best 
ultimately best wines, and that is Burgundy. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. that is, again, we're looking at the Rhone River Valley and the Saone River Valley. So it runs north, south, and it opens up down below on the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And as you go up, you get Beaujolais, and then you go further up, you get into the Burgundy region, which is also a region of very complex wines. It is not uh, in number of... Uh, hectares probably not as big as Bordeaux, but mm-hmm. it is of course very very big and very very famous. I have and to say the Beaujolais each year, it's you know there's the Beaujolais Nouveau and they they advertise the fact that they, this is the new this year the new wine, and I, every year I buy a bottle and every year I think I'm not doing that again. It, it's not that good. No, I, I don't even drink Beaujolais. I mean, I actually, Beaujolais to me, it's diluted is, wine, so yeah, I, it's, I don't like it very much. I, I some really, people do. Yeah, yeah, some people love it, uh, but for me, it doesn't do anything. It's more of a, um, I don't know, it's kind of uh, acrid. I don't know, I don't like it. So the next one is this one that I'd never heard of before. It's a very, very small region. It's a wine that comes from the foothills of the Alps in the area called Savoy, yeah. which is the very high uh, Alps. This is where you get the towns like Chamonix and, and places like that. Right. The wine is called Bougie. 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 B-U-G-E-Y. And it is a specific white wine. You got me there. I've never heard of that. comes from the foothills and is drunk locally. And it's an AOC wine. And it's an AOC wine. All of these that I'm mentioning huh. are actually AOC wines. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I'll, the next time I go up in that region, which actually probably will be sometime in the next six months, um, I'm going to make an effort to find a couple of bottles of this. And one for me. And one for you. Okay. And one for you. All okay. Right. So <laughs> we'll, we'll figure out that, what that one is. And I really can't tell you anything more about it, except yeah. that it does really exist. And I um, found out that, yes, people who live up in that area do drink it. And I went, well, I'll be. There you are. (laughs) Uh, And the next one, of course, is one we have talked about. It was one of our first podcasts, and that is the region of Champagne. Yeah. Because now we're not going to talk about specifically whether a wine is bubbly or not bubbly, but most of the time what we're talking about is wines in general that are what we call wines that are still, uh, which means they don't have Mm -hmm. bubbles in them. But, of course, the Champagne region is a major wine-growing region. Yeah. The next one on the list, remember we're doing this in in uh, alphabetical order. You're going really fast. You're tearing through here. Yeah, because I want to get to the subject of today. Okay, and, okay, you know, okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the next one is Corsican wines. Ah, yes. Those uh, are nice. And they are lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, again, uh, Corsica, which uh, is a very big island uh, off the coast of the, it's off, it's in the Mediterranean. It's uh, somewhere uh, south of Nice. It's actually closer to Nice than it is to Marseille and is uh, a very big island that used to be a number of centuries ago a part of Genoa, uh, the Genoa Principality, and was basically given or bought by the French. I'm not even sure exactly. I should know that. <laughs> um, and is French. Uh, it's French. Barely. Barely. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but we love them. Uh, it is a gorgeous place. <laughs> it is absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And I know it well. And it makes wonderful wines that, again, like the Alsatian wines, are very, very distinctive. Uh, they are strong. They make uh, rosé and red, a little bit of white, but mostly rosés and reds. And they have varieties of grapes that are really unique to uh, Corsica. Mm and that are not used anywhere else. So they have a very, very distinctive taste, and I like them. I Mm -hmm. actually do Mm -hmm. like them quite a lot. Yeah, I like them too. Uh, The next area uh, is, again, uh, a a smaller area, and I have to confess that even though I knew that wines came from this area, I don't think I have ever tasted any of them, and that is the region of the Jura. Oh, I've had some. And the Jura are mountains Mm -hmm. that are... Hmm, I, well, let's see, how would you explain this? These are um, above the Haute-Savoie, above the highest part of the Alps, but are a part of the chain of the Alps, mm-hmm. and it's further up north. They're not quite as high. It's a region that is actually very, very beautiful. The main city in the region is uh, Besançon, mm-hmm. uh, which is a small city, but is very, very lovely. And uh, it's the region that produces the cheese called Comté. 
Mm. Uh, it comes from the Jura, <laughs> which is a cheese Annie I both love. <laughs> and uh, it, they produce a what they call a yellow wine, which means that it is a white wine that is ever so slightly sweet. And it actually, right. I have actually seen it. I just don't remember if I've tasted it. And it, That's what I was going to hmm. say. It's sweet it's a, wine. It's a, it's a somewhat sweet wine, and it is genuinely golden colored, as opposed to some of the white wines that are so pale, where you you don't really see whether you're drinking wine or water in you your know, glass. You know, I. I <clears throat> I'd have to pay attention next time. I I, I didn't pay attention to that. Yeah. It, which, and which makes me a, not a wine connoisseur because anybody who knows anything about wine, they will pay attention to the color of the wine. Maybe. But yeah. if you've only had it once, you may not have realized true, it. True. You may not remember, you know, yeah, in that yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is a wine that you would have to go to a specialty wine store where we are, which is in the southwest of France to find because it's a, yeah. not a wine that is uh, created in huge quantities and it's really a connoisseur's wine. Mm -hmm. right. The next uh, area is a very big area that's very, very close to where we are and that used to produce basically your bottom line table wines and is now producing excellent wines and that is the area of Languedoc. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the region... Uh, there are some really, really lovely wines. I happen to like some of them very, very much. We will eventually get around to talking about the wines in that area. I was just at a wine shop yesterday uh, talking to someone who specializes in high-end wines from all over, not just in France. And he said that he carries uh, four or five from Languedoc that he thinks are really very, very, very good wines. And these are wines... But that's the exception, not the rule, honestly. Well, you and I don't agree on Languedoc wines. Yeah. You don't like I, them. I, no, not yeah, really. I no. do. I happen to like them a lot. And yeah. in fact, it's my favorite area for wines, mm. I, for, for reds. Um, I don't like Bordeaux wines at all. Yeah, so. I, it's, I'm not a Bordeaux person either. But uh, I think that the, in the Languedoc wines, where you have the Minervois and... and uh, a bunch of other wines. They yeah, are excellent, Minervois excellent Corbière. wines. Minervois Corbière. So does that include Minervois and oh, Corbière? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Corbière and Minervois, Well, I you enjoy. know, they, they, they put this down as two separate areas, Languedoc and Roussillon. In my mind, they're all grouped together, okay? We're, we're talking to people out there who don't know what we're talking about. If yeah, you yeah. look at a map of France in the southwest, not the southeast, but the southwest, when you have uh, from the coast of the Mediterranean going inland you have a very large, large region that is basically called Languedoc-Roussillon. Mm -hmm. And it goes as far south as the border with Spain. Right. And it's a very big area. And it, they have separated into two. So it, I'm not going to be able to tell you if what I really like is more Languedoc or more Roussillon at this point. I really wouldn't be able to say. Yeah. There are uh, more probably Roussillon wines, which are the part further south, yeah. that are probably very, very good than yeah, the part in, in Languedoc. Yeah, right. yeah. the All of that, in, including um, the Fitu and all of those wines. Yeah. And uh, the region Languedoc-Roussillon uh, has a strange history, and for a good part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, it was basically the area that produced the most wine, but that it was your basic bottom-of-the-line table wine that had no character and was not considered to be very good. And then uh, starting after World War II with the uh, investment in uh, the area by people who were experts in winemaking, uh, things changed. And now it is an area where people do come and look for very good wines. So it's a very interesting story. And we'll, we'll eventually, of course, get around to talking about those. Yeah. Another one that is a small wine producing area that's very close to the Alsatian area. And, uh, and that is Lorraine. Mm -hmm. which is actually west of, of Alsace on the other side of the mountains. It's very, very, very small area. I don't know very much about the wines except that they're mostly whites. And in fact, in general, the further north you go, the more it tends to be white wines rather than red wines. And it's, it's apparently, in terms of uh, surface area, it's even smaller than the Bougie. Uh, mm. And uh, it, they say it is the smallest wine growing area as a distinctive area in France. Mm, okay. And then the one that we will eventually in a couple of minutes come to, to talk about an area that has wines that I absolutely love. And that is the Valley of the Loire River. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Loire River is one of the uh, main major rivers in France. And it runs largely 
uh, east-west, and it's a long river. It's almost a thousand kilometers long, and it is one of the biggest, interestingly, uh, uh, wine-producing areas in France. And it's very, very famous. Even though it produces rosé and red, it is very famous for its absolutely wonderful, sublime white wines. Yeah. So we will yeah. be getting back to that in a few minutes and talking about the different parts of the valley and the names of some of the wines there. After that, you have in the southeast of France, you have the region of Provence, right? which also has some very lovely wines. Mm -hmm. And if you are someone who likes rosés, the very yeah. best rosés produced anywhere are produced in Provence. Mm -hmm. They're very good. And uh, they also produce some reds and some whites. Uh, the variety of grapes are very often very distinctive and mixed together there, but it's uh, very nice. And because Provence is a region that's very Mediterranean, which means it has a very long, hot summer, it specializes in wines that are lovely to drink in the hot weather in the summertime. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. really that kind of wine. Uh, there are two or three places uh, uh, in, uh, along the coast in Provence uh, that are known for being places where you can go. And one of the wines that's very famous is a wine called Bandol, B-A-N-D-O-L, mm. which produces white and red and rosé. Uh, after that, uh, we have the Rhone, uh, which is interesting because the Rhone is a huge, of course, river that runs north-south. Uh, it's basically, if you look at a map, you would say that in a line, you have first... The Rhone wines, which means Côte de Rhone. Yeah. And then as you go up further, a little bit north, you get the Beaujolais. And then a little bit up above that are the Burgundies. So there's a kind of continuity, uh, mm -hmm. but they're distinctive. You know, the, there's a region that is de designated as being Côte de Rhone. And then there's another that's the Beaujolais, and then there's another as Burgundy. But you wouldn't see that as you're driving up, uh, if you're going north-south that way. Basically, you would not know. You would just have to wait for the signs of the villages <laughs> that say, here is Côte de this and Côte de that, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, it's more along the same line. And it's interesting because uh, the, the land is not that different, but the climate obviously changes as you go from south to north or the other way around, from north sure, to south. sure. Another small area that produces wines that I have tasted that can be very nice, uh, that is Savoy, uh, which is uh, close and akin to some of the wines in the Jura area or this very mysterious little thing called the Buget area, mm -hmm. which we've never heard of before. And uh, in the Savoy, you have some reds, but it's very famous for its whites. And these are the whites that are very often drunk with fondue. Mm -hmm. and raclette, these mm -hmm. famous dishes that are largely based on uh, cheese yeah, and cheese. potatoes and things. And, you know, cold winter, you want a nice hearty <laughs> dish and very nice uh, fruity uh, white wines that, that are grown surprisingly in the mountains in, in, on the uh, slopes of the mountains in the region of Savoy. And last but not least, uh, it's a large designation, and it really deserves some subcategories, and that is what is called uh, officially uh, the southwestern wines, the wines of the southwest of France, which means quite literally the wines not very far from where we are here, Yeah, uh, which, uh, which includes a lot of small different groups of wine uh, that, that all come under this, uh, this category, and... Um, we will do one podcast just for the wines in this area because there are quite a few and some of them are wonderful wines and people in the South know about them and some people in Northern France don't even know about all of them and they do not export that much. But we have some wonderful wines in this area. We have wines in a region called Cao, you have Gaillac, you have Madiron, you have the wines of Jurançon. All of these are wines that are basically from what is designated as the Southwest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, there's a lot of wine produced. And just to give everybody uh, an idea, although it's not imaginable because it's a number that is really sort of, uh, you can't really visualize. Uh, every year, 4 million hectoliters of wine are produced. Mm. And a hectoliter is a 1,000 liters. So four million. Four million times a thousand. That's a lot of wine. That's a lot of wine. 
That would fill a lot of swimming pools. A lot of swimming pools. <laughs> a whole lot of swimming pools. It sure would. Well, the thing is, France makes a lot of wines, but one of the difficulties is how do they distribute these wines? Because, um, for instance, if you run a restaurant, you will get your wines through one distribution channel. Right. But then if you want to find the same wine at the grocery store, you can't because the restaurants get their wines from through their channel and the grocery stores get them from their channels there are some wines that are produced in france exclusively for, for export or for export for right. export they don't sell any in france and so there are a bunch of french wines that are just exported and you have to understand that to export to the american market you need to be a pretty big wine right. grower Right. Otherwise, it's too expensive. It's just there are so many levels of bureaucracy and hoops you have to jump through in America to be able to sell your wine. So the wines that you get in America, the French wines, are, for the most part, they're from massive wine producers. Right, they are. If, if they're not, you can't. They can't afford the export cost. And, and they tend to be expensive wines. They tend to be more expensive because a 10-year-old bottle in France will be at least 20 or 25. Probably even more. Yeah, once it gets exported. Right. So, so what I'm saying to you is if you want to drink some of the local French wines... Do it while in France. Yes. Because yes. the chances <clears throat> are you're not going to find them in no. when you go home. At least in the U.S., Canada, I'm not sure. Australia, I'm not sure. But I know that for for the U.S., it's it's really complicated. And there's one, uh, there's something else besides that, which is something that's not quite the same thing, but it's also a question of exclusivity. There are some wine producers who sell only to restaurants. Yeah, and that is something that's very special here in France as well. You can find that you drink a very nice wine in a restaurant. And if you go to try and buy some bottles, you will discover that, in fact, they simply do not sell to retail stores. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because I think, uh, from a commercial point of view, it's their way of making sure that their bottles of wine are sold. So they don't even want to bother with individual clients on a retail basis. Right. And it's a shame because sometimes it's very nice wines, but you really will not be able to get them outside right. of a restaurant. And sometimes these kind of chateaus that are, have exclusive deals will open up a store. And so if you happen to drive past and you stop by, they will sell you, you know, they will sell the visitors some bottles, but they don't want to go into the, you know, massive distribution for a grocery store. That's right. just a completely ball, different ball game, and they don't want to play that. And, and, and just before we start talking about the specific wines of the Loire Valley, just to know that in France, you can buy wine in any supermarket. You can buy any alcoholic beverage, in fact, in any supermarket. That's just what is done in a lot of the cases of, of, for many people. And then, of course, you have specialty wine shops. And in general, you also have a third uh, establishment, if you want to call it that, which is basically co what is called a cave. And a cave is basically a wholesaler that is someone who gets wine directly from a producer, sometimes even in barrels, and will sell it for much less overhead to people, whether the wine is actually bottled or whether you actually bring a container and you get the wine actually poured out of the barrel. And that is what, of course, a lot of people do on a general basis for everyday wines because if you go to a supermarket, some supermarkets have a good selection, but of course it will never ever in any event be a complete selection. And then you have specialty wine stores which are becoming much more popular but tend to be very much the high end of mm -hmm. the range. And then you get the Cavist, who specialize usually in one specific region. So here, for instance, where we are, the Cavist would be someone who would have wines that are really from the southwest and not from all over France. Right. And, of course, the other option, if you are traveling around, is if you are traveling by car and you are traveling and visiting one of the regions that have been mentioned, and specifically one of the larger regions, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Loire Valley, uh, southwest of France, you will find lots of signs that indicate where there are 
the chateaus and very often uh, they do sell wines directly to people so yeah and you will see a sign that says degustation yes which means tasting tasting <coughs> and what that means is you show up and they and and they will offer they, they also would you like to try white or red or and they'll give you yes, a little taste but and... warning because uh, i don't know if it's changed and of course i haven't been living in the states in a long time but i did uh, i used to live in california And at the time I was living there, you could go to a winery and get a tasting for free. And that is not true in France. Most wine tastings in France, unless it's a special day, uh, sometimes the different chateaus have two or three days a year when they have what they call an open house. And they invite everyone to come and taste the wines. But otherwise, you will only get a tasting for free if in fact after doing the tasting you buy a lot of wine mm -hmm. otherwise they will charge you now it won't necessarily be a lot of money but they will charge you a couple of euros for doing some tastings so see i've never yeah. been charged for tasting oh i have mm. and i have also in i have in languedoc and i have in gaillac mm. and in in in, in bordeaux Uh, you won't get a free tasting unless you're in a store. And if you're in a store, which is where we did last time, it's different because it's not the chateau. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's very, it's not quite the same. And everybody makes their own rule when it comes to tasting. Of course. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know. So let's talk a little bit about the wines of the Loire Valley. Mm. <clears throat> Now, the Loire Valley is uh, a very magnificent uh, river that, as I mentioned, runs about 1,000 kilometers, which is about 600 miles, relatively east-west. And it's about, um, I, I'm going to, um, I, I was going to say it cuts France in half, but I would say that um, it's actually about two-thirds of the way up. If you think of uh, France uh, in terms of the shape of the hexagon, and if you imagine where the Loire Valley uh, is, the river actually runs about two-thirds of the way up the country, so it's not really quite split in half. And uh, the, the, there are major regions. It is one of the largest wine-producing areas. It has different regions that produce different wines. The Loire Valley produces a lot of wine, but it is the most famous, except for a couple of reds, and I will mention their names in, in a few minutes, but it is largely famous for producing an enormous variety of wonderful white wines. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Loire Valley, like uh, some other regions of France, is, of course, a part of the country that used to be under a sea millions of years ago. So it is, um, it is covered on both sides with chalk and limestone cliffs. And it is chalk and limestone that are necessary for creating the mineral in the soil that is necessary for producing good wines. And this is also true, of course, of the Rhone Valley, uh, for the Rhone River, and for uh, other parts of the, the Bordeaux area as well. It's all limestone and chalk, and it's very, very important. Now, as we mentioned, you know, designation is by not only the region, but you have a different designation for the part of the land that's flat on the bottom of the riverbed and the other part that's on the slopes going up the sides. And each little area has its own designation. So in the Loire Valley region, you have a few basic different kinds of wines. And that is, I'm just going to mention them because underneath that, you know, you have maybe hundreds of different names of chateaus, which we're not really going to be no. talking about. <laughs> But the, if you go f the farthest west, close to the city of Nantes, which is really um, almost at the beginning of Brittany, and it has a climate that picks up a little bit of an oceanic uh, flavor to it and probably even adds a little bit of salt to the air. I wouldn't be surprised. You have a whole gamma of wines that are very light and very nice and that are known for being wonderful to drink with seafood and fish, and that is the wines that are called muscadet. So we have the wine that comes from the region around Nantes, uh, and it actually covers a fair territory. It covers just about 12,000 hectares, which is a lot of territory. Yeah, uh, Both sides of the Loire Valley, south and east of the city of Nantes, Uh, and this wine called Muscadet, M-U-S-C-A-D-E-T, 
It's very interesting. It happens to be a wine that I love to use on aperit- as an aperitif wine. Because yeah, it's, it's a sweet wine. It, no. Muscadet? No, not musca. Muscadet. Oh, sorry. No. Oh. Oh, no. No. <sighs> A muscadet. A muscadet. A fake French person. She really. is a fake French person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, no. It's a dry, very dry, oh, okay. yep. very dry, very light white wine. Mm-hmm. And it is made from a variety of grape. I love the name of it. Uh, that doesn't, isn't used anywhere else in France. And it's called uh, Melon of Burgundy. Mm. Melon, M E L O N. Melon de Bourgogne. Melon de Bourgogne is exactly the name of it, yes. Okay. And uh, it, it turns out that the story of this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, in the earliest days, and I just uh, I will eventually go back and do a little bit of history, but in the very earliest days of wine growing in this whole region, which is really about 1500 years ago. Uh, this this particular variety of, of grape was grown f- much further east, in fact, in the Burgundy area. And there were other varieties of grapes that were grown along the Loire Valley, starting as far back as the Romans. And at some point in history, there was some kind of period of, of t- two or three years where there was terrible, there were terrible cold, cold winters. Mm. <clears throat> and all of the other grape varieties uh, froze and suffered from the cold except for this one called the Malone of Burgundy. And so it, they just... I have never heard that name. They would, it was decided, you know, it was decided. I'm not, you know, it was probably the Benedictine monks because they were basically the ones who produced wine, drank wine, and sold wine forever <laughs> and ever anyway. But what they did was they decided that because this was the hardiest of all of the grape varieties, that they would take it and transplant it and plant it in this region south and east of Nantes and it has been planted there ever since. Mm. And it is the sole grape variety that is used for this wine, the Muscadet. Mm. And uh, it's not an expensive wine. I love it. It's just very light. It's very She's fresh. She's a cheap date. I'm a cheap date. <laughs> what can you do? However, if you want to get the very best of the Muscadet, and that is a that is, of course, that's the one I get. Well, after all, I'm not course, that cheap a date. Right. Uh, it's called Muscadet sur Lie. L-I-E. L-I-E. And it's because it is a... L-I-E. L-I-E. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it's because it is a wine that is grown in a certain part of the Loire Valley mm-hmm. where there is a certain complexity to the, so- to the soil. And that is why it's literally called sur And I'm not even sure what the mineral quality is, but I was reading about it yesterday and mm-hmm. it really is very specific. And it's so it's a reduced... It's inside this whole large region called the area of Muscadet. And it is, um, it creates a wine that has a bit more complexity and a bit more flavor and aroma because otherwise it's just a very, very light white wine. Yeah. And I in France, it is really, if you go to a seafood or a French um, a fish restaurant, <clears throat> obviously you have a variety of wines that can be uh, purchased, but a standard wine uh, that is considered to be very respectable to drink with either seafood, seafood or fish is indeed this Muscadet. Um, would not to be mistaken with muscat, right? right? That's that's the mistake. Which I is made the south with well, the yeah. southern sweet syrupy wine. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So the second uh, group of wines that are along the Loire River Valley is the wines called the wines from Anjou, A N J O U, which is centered. I've had those. Yes, I've had those too. They're yeah. actually quite nice. Yeah, centered around the city of Angers. And uh, it's a fairly large uh, wine growing area with nine thousand hectares of wine. It's called the AOC. Anjou. And here we have what can be called light or medium bodied reds mm. and lovely, lovely dry whites. And so the basic varieties of grapes, and now we're going to hear these varieties of grapes over and over, even though it's going to change in proportion as we go further east along the Loire Valley. You have for reds, you have Cabernet Sauvignon, mm. you have Cabernet Franc, mm. and a very funny little local variety of grape that is used in percentages of about 5 or 10%, which adds some kind of extra taste to it, called the grolo, <laughs> which is very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is for reds G-R-O- and roses. G-R-O-L-L-E-A-U. Grolo. Okay. All right. And for whites, uh, the two distinctive varieties that are extremely important in, tar- in, in, in talking about any of the whites of the Loire Valley, and that is Chenin Blanc, 
Mm -hmm. which is the very, very, very original white variety that is truly from that area, mm -hmm. and Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Uh, and then you have a little bit of Chardonnay. Chardonnay, which is, of course is a grape that is grown everywhere in France for whites, but is used with other grapes in different combinations right. to make the taste. And of course, remember, what we're talking about is it's the land, the soil, and the climate as much as or more than the varieties of grapes that give the taste of these wines. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the white wines that are produced in this area are lovely. These are more complex. This is not anything like the Muscadet. You have very lovely whites with uh, citrus notes and, and, and fruit notes, and they are, these are wonderful. And We are going to talk about these more because this is really what has made the fame of uh, the wines of the Loire Valley. Then keeping, as we go further east, we get to uh, the region around the town called Saumur, S-A-U-M-U-R. Mm. And again, the same thing. You have, it's a little bit smaller area uh, for the red wines. It's... Uh, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon. Usually, there's usually a kind of six four percentage proportion of these uh, two. I'm not sure sometimes which one. Here, um, apparently, I was reading. I was surprised. It's almost exclusively just the Chenin Blanc, mm. and it gives it a very distinctive taste in, in these wines. And uh, these are the wines that are grown more on the sides of the banks of the river. And then we get to. Uh, the area that has the largest surface and produces the most. And these are the wines in the area around the city of Tours. Mm -hmm. And these are the Touraine. Yeah. And this is where you get to see a smile on my face <laughs> because my two favorite wines, and at this point I'm very much into white wines. I know that some people out there think that there's no such thing as a good white wine, but I happen to oh, be in a period yeah, of time I like when them. I absolutely love white wines. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, the, the Touraine area produces 700,000 hectoliters alone, just this area <laughs> of the Loire Valley, 13,000 and hectares of land. And one of the things that makes the wines in this region even more special than along the valley before is that this is part of the Loire Valley where you have cliffs, these limestone and chalk cliffs, yep. and they use the caves in the cliffs to age the wines. Mm. And it helps give them this very nice taste. And interestingly enough, here you have a lot of wine produced with the Gamay grape. Mm. And the Pinot Noir, which is very unusual because the Pinot Noir is a grape that's basically associated with Burgundy wines. Yes, usually. And the Gamay is very much a wine that is a, uh, is a variety of wine associated with this region. And uh, the Touraine area produces rosés and reds, which are a mix of Gamay and a Pinot Noir, and whites, which are Chenin Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm. And uh, here we can mention the names of some very specific wines because these are wines you will find in stores even in the United States. Mm. And they are very, very wonderful. And the wine that is the white wine that I love is Vouvray. Uh -huh. And Vouvray is a lovely, lovely white wine. And it comes both in a regular wine and even in a bubbly, naturally effervescent wine. Mm. And it is a wine that is largely Chenin Blanc and a little bit of uh, Cabernet. Hmm. So it's very, very interesting. And you have the AOC also that is simply called the Chinon, C H I N O N, right. which is lovely. And in the Reds, you have two wines. And I was just reading an article in Le Monde uh, this morning, actually. I have the paper from last week where they're talking about the different regions of winemaking in France. And this is one of them. They say that in the last few years has become one of the best that you can get. And it's a red. It's called Bourgueil. Hmm. And it is a wine from this region. And uh, this is a very, very lovely wine. Hmm. And there's another one called Cheverny. Uh, Cheverny. 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 And all of these are wines that you would be able to find in a good specialty wine store, even in the United States. Well, that's good. And then the last of these areas, which is actually not just east, but going further a bit south because the Loire Valley actually curves and goes south because it comes out of the mountains in the central part of France, has some of the wines that also are well known. And these are what are considered to be the finest of the white wines. Hmm. And that is, it includes, do you want to try and guess? 
Mm. <laughs> She's good. I guess. No, I'm not going to guess. She's not going to guess. Wrong. I'll get wrong. No, yeah. you probably wouldn't get it wrong, but you just have to think about it a little bit because, so this is the era what that produces, ones? should I give you a hint? Yeah, give me a hint. One of them begins with an S. Saumur? Sincère. Ah, les sincères. Oh, bon, ah, oui, c'est très bon, ça. Right. Oh, yeah. Don't, so, let's be sincere. Let's, the sincère is wonderful, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sincère right. wine. The sincère really wine. Good. So this is, this is a Sauvignon Blanc with a little bit of, of, of Chenin Blanc. So in this area, you have the other one of my favorite white wines and uh, besides sincère, and that is Pouilly Fumé. Oh, yes. And Pouilly is actually... Uh, it's a horrible word to pronounce. I have to put a lot of effort into that, you know. Uh, Pouilly. It's, Pouilly. Uh, Pouilly. It's a town and a small little region. And so all the wines that come from that town and the little bit of region around it are Pouilly. So it's Pouilly sur Loire, Pouilly Fumé, Pouilly. Uh, and these were wines uh, uh, that were started by the Benedictine monks. Mm. Wow. And these are considered to be... Uh, of the finest of the red of the of the white wines and the finest of all of the white wines of the you, Loire Valley. You know, for those that you mentioned that can be found in the U.S., mm -hmm. I'll, if I find them, I'll put a link on the website so you can. I'm sure you, you know. I'll make your life right. easier. It, Sancerre, you can find in the states. Pouilly Fumé, you can find in the states. Mm -hmm. I've actually bought it in the states. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so the, obviously the smaller chateaus in the smaller areas sure, are sure. not necessarily as well known, sure. but. It, it, what's interesting is that as you get further south and then you go towards either the Burgundy region or the Bordeaux region or even to the region where we are in the southwest, you have a lot richer, heavier, fuller reds mm -hmm. and a little bit of whites. And even in Bordeaux, there is not a lot of white wine. There is in Burgundy. There are some beautiful uh, white wines in Burgundy, of course. But the largest area that produces very good and excellent white wines is the Loire Valley. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's because of weather conditions, uh, whether that's because of the choice of the grapes, I, it's really interesting. I have absolutely no idea. But I do know that when I was in Medoc last year, and we went all through the Medoc area. Now, Medoc uh, is it's Bordeaux. Medoc is Bordeaux, yeah. and it's a part of, it's a big, major part of the Bordeaux area. Um, I basically gave up trying to find a bottle of white wine, you know, and, and <laughs> there was no point. And I realized I was in the wrong place, you know. I was, <laughs> I thought, oh, it was kind of like, uh, I guess I shouldn't be asking for white wine here, you know. <laughs> they don't really want to talk to me anymore. I mean, they're just showing me all these wonderful bottles of red wine. Uh, but just, it, it's really wonderful. So just very, very quickly, because we, we don't want to make this too much longer, but what is really wonderful, and of course, you know, this is where I get crazed because I love all this stuff, um, it turns out that the good old Romans were the ones that brought the original grapevines to the Loire Valley area, just mm. like they did pretty much everywhere mm -hmm. else. But what happened was that they actually planted them first around the city of Nantes, which is really at the beginning of Brittany. So it's a very unlikely place to imagine them deciding to do grape wines. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that they did very, very well there. And uh, in the first century, uh, the, the Pliny the Elder, who is our wonderful, wonderful Roman historian, who just went around talking about everything basically you, there is to talk about. He was probably worse than me as far as being a yacker, you know. Um, he wrote about them, and he wrote about the wines uh, that were being produced along the Loire River and mm. talked about how wonderful they were. Mm. And uh, the, the Romans, of course, drank wine every day, and wine was diluted with water, uh, but they mostly drank red wine, but obviously they started to appreciate white wines because of the wines along the uh, Loire River Valley. Very good. And it was in the 400s that the Benedictine monks, who basically started existing in, in I think, more or less about that time, they were the ones... Uh, not only did they produce wine, in fact, this is, if people remember in the Champagne podcast, it was also monks that were producing the Champagne. Yes. Because the, what was interesting is that the monks produced wine, not just for themselves, but they actually produced wine to sell, to make money for the monastery. Sure. And they were the ones who were uh, responsible for the idea of making wine as a commerce, which is really fascinating when you think about it, because it's a different idea of, uh, religious people, you know, monks. And one of the reasons why 
For centuries, the Loire Valley was the center of all real wine growing and good commerce was because the Loire River was a river that was able, that they could use for transportation. Mm -hmm. Unlike some of the other major rivers, it didn't have some of the dangers that some of the others had. And so they actually used the river to take the uh, wine in barrels on barges up to the estuary at Nantes and out to the Atlantic. And something I didn't know, but that uh, Henry II, who was the husband of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Uh Aha. I've heard of her. You've heard of her. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you've heard of him too, you know. He was the Count of Anjou, and he was also the King of England. Oh. Well, he became the King of England after she married him. And Uh uh, in 1154, he went from Anjou to London, to reclaim the crown and to become the king of England. And yeah. his territory, thanks to her and him, included pretty much almost all of Western France as well as England. And because he was originally from Anjou, he said he made it a law that it was wines from Anjou that had to be served at the English court. Mm. And from the year 500, when the Benedictines started shipping it out, till the 1500s, all the wines that were served in the court in both France and in England were from the Loire Valley, huh. which belies what the people in Bordeaux say about the history of their wines. But <laughs> we're, we're lots of things to talk about then. Uh, and then, strangely enough, it was the Dutch merchants. This is where you wind up getting into a, the world capital of commerce, which didn't just exist for the last 50 years, but has existed for forever and ever. Yeah. The Dutch merchants, who were excellent, you know, uh, um, commercial people, I mean, they just sold and bought and sold everything and did import and export, they set up a a bit of an industry in Nantes, and they started shipping the Loire Valley wines as far as Holland and even further up into the northern countries, and it was uh, really very, very important, far more important than the wines further south in France. And I didn't know this, but this is what's so fabulous, is that that lasted until the 18th century. Hmm. And it was because of the freezes that killed out most of the variety of grapes that they started going further south and using the wines that were produced further south because there was less of a danger of losing lots of money from the problems with weather. And then, of course, you come into the 19th century when you have... Uh, something that, of course, everyone, I think, does know about who's interested in wine, and that is you have the terrible epidemic of phylloxeria, which uh, killed everything, Mm -hmm. everywhere. And there were only a couple of varieties of grapes that actually survived that. And what happened was that after that, it was largely the wines in the Bordeaux and in the Burgundy area that were replanted with grape cuttings from the United States Mm -hmm. that were the grandchildren of the grape cuttings from there. And it has only been in the last 50 years that the wines from further north have started to become as reputable and popular as they used to be. Hmm. Very interesting. So there you are. So the Loire Valley produces (laughs) wonderful wines. And we should have some. And we should have some, <laughs> definitely. Did you, did you notice no slurring, right? She... I, am, I, am I slurring yet? <laughs> no. no. Not yet, not yet. I will be in a couple of minutes. <laughs> oh, dear. Is that it? That's it. Oh, That's it. well, thank I can't you. wait to open the bottle now. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. We'll well, get to okay, that. You, prom- <laughs> you promised me, you promised me. <laughs> I'll make her work for her. We, we, we can't. Yeah, you do. You really do. <laughs> well, it's too bad we can't give people a taste over the over the microphone because. Yeah. Uh, but but it will, we'll put up some names of some of these uh, varieties. Right. I'll give you direct links for the ones I can find, and then you can and try you, them if you and wish. And you can try them and tell us what you think. But you have to be really careful because in America, this is this is a cultural difference between the two countries. But the glasses, the wine glasses that they pour wine in are huge. In the States? Yes. Don't fill it up. You're not supposed to. Right. But if you happen to be with somebody who fills it up, you know, just 10% more, you end up drinking quite a bit more. You do. You do. I I think it's, you have to be, um, 
judicious yeah. in your consumption of these uh, wonderful products. But it is true that they're not meant to be filled up. They're actually meant to be filled up only about a third of the way. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the form of the glass mostly is to allow the aromas to come out right, right. and uh, all of that. But, uh, but the everyday wine glasses we use in France are, are much, much smaller. smaller. Yes, yeah. they certainly are. Yeah, because if we used... Even water glasses in France are much smaller well, than in America. Let's face it, everything is smaller in France. That's true. We're small people. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Elise. We'll, you are welcome, uh, Eddie. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Next week. Allez, au revoir. Au revoir.